So hello everybody. Um, I hope most of you will know who I am. I'm Helen Cross. I'm a pr the Prince of Wales Chair of Childhood Epilepsy and Paediatric Neurologist in London, UK. Um, I'm also currently the Treasurer and President-elect of the International League Against Epilepsy. It's my delight tonight to talk about ketogenic diet therapies in the epilepsies and happy to take any questions um, following the presentation. It's a delight to talk to you this afternoon on ketogenic diet therapies, specifically in the treatment of the epilepsies. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. So as we talk about ketogenic diet therapies, I'm going to cover several areas over the next 30 minutes or so. What is it specifically? Does it work? And looking at the alternative forms of the ketogenic diet that we may utilize, the practicalities of implementation, barriers to implementation. Can we predict who may respond and whom should it be considered? Can we implement it across the lifespan? And where are we going from here? So the ketogenic diet, a high fat diet designed to mimic the metabolic effects of starvation used in the treatment of epilepsy for almost 100 years. Next year, 2021, does see 100 years since the publication of Wilder's initial three cases utilizing a high fat diet to mimic the effects of starvation, generating ketonemia in the treatment of epilepsy, with later publications of large cohorts of patients where the ketogenic diet was utilized. However, it is not a natural treatment. Many patients come to us wanting to utilize the diet because they see it as a natural treatment. It's utilizing natural products, but on implementation, it needs to be monitored as it has side effects, just like any other anti-seizure medication. We now have randomized controlled trials demonstrating efficacy specifically in drug-resistant epilepsy in children. The graph on the left shows the results of our randomized controlled trial, where children between the ages of two and 16 were recruited with continuing seizures, despite at least two, although in many cases, many more anti-epileptic medications. And they were randomized to either receive a ketogenic diet or no change in treatment over a three month period. And you can see that there was a significant reduction in the ketogenic diet treated group over a three month period compared to baseline and also um, compared to uh, uh, no change in treatment. On the right is a study then was subsequently published from India using similar methodology, but again in children aged two to 14, continuing seizures despite anti-epileptic medication, utilizing a modified ketogenic diet, formerly an Atkins diet, where it is high fat, but um, uh, low carbohydrate and unlimited protein. This demonstrated similarly that there was a significant reduction in seizures from baseline compared to no change in treatment in the ketogenic diet therapy group. And now if we look at the most recent Cochrane review, where they were determined 13 randomized control trials in 17 publications. Admittedly, some of these randomized trials look at methods of implementation, such as randomization to fasting versus not fasting at initiation, or indeed um, hospitalization versus non-hospitalization. But for the first time in this Cochrane Review published this year, you could see that actually there were four studies that could be utilized in a meta-analysis, giving a total number of those on the diet of 193 and those of 192 who had usual care or no change in treatment and showing that there was a definite um, favoring of the ketogenic diet in treatment um, with effect over and above no change in treatment. So now we know also that we have a range of different ways to administer the diet. The classical diet, as was originally put forward in the 1920s, was a high fat, low carbohydrate, low protein diet. And indeed, where the majority of fat came from long chain fats and the ratio of fat to carbohydrate, including protein, was four or three to one. 
It was in the early 1970s when Hunterlocker put forward that as this diet was perhaps quite unpalatable with a lot of side effects, perhaps using medium chain fat, where medium chain triglycerides generate more ketones per calorie than long chain fat, we could utilize, uh, utilizing MCT in the diet, we could actually perhaps free it for, to some degree with regard to protein and carbohydrate, although it was still a low carbohydrate diet. And indeed the MCT diet was born. We now also have the modified ketogenic diet therapy where there's unlimited protein and low carbohydrate. And we also have put forward the low glycemic index therapy, um, looking at complexity of sugars that may be digested. This hasn't been put forward and shown to be effective by um, uh, the group at Mass General in, in Boston. And we know if we look at the different therapies, there may be a different degree of ketosis, and also the different therapies may be tailored to the age group that we're trying to treat. So for example, in the infant and even the preschool um, child, where um, they uh, can monitor what they eat quite carefully, um, then the classical diet may be the way to go forward, and certainly you get the higher degree of ketosis with the classical diet. An MCT diet may be more appropriate in the older child, maybe of school age, and even of the adolescent. Whereas the modified ketogenic therapy, uh, therapy um, may have a much greater degree of compliance in the many, much older, including adolescent and adult, or even the low glycemic index therapy. And we now know that um, the diet can be administered in many countries of the world, implying that we can utilize the diet in many different cultures of the world which diet is utilized again may depend on what is the main um, base of the diet. For example, if rice or pasta may be a main, substitute main um, uh, base of the uh, diet in that particular um, culture, then maybe the MCT or the modified ketogenic diet therapy may be easier. Whereas in th uh, cultures where um, there may need to be a degree of um, uh, reimbursement for therapies, then the classical ketogenic diet therapy may be a way forward. So what about implementation? Well, in 2009, um, Eric Gross have brought a group, uh, together a group of um, pediatric neurologists and dietitians and nutritionists in order to try and come up with some recommendations with regard to implementation of the ketogenic diet. And indeed, it was recognized at the time that we couldn't generate enough data or enough data hadn't been generated to, to give formal guidance, but certainly recommendations could be made on the basis of the literature and indeed consensus opinion. And these were originally published, as I said, in 2009, and then updated, published um, as outlined here in 2018. There have also, as a result of um, working with the International League Against Epilepsy, um, determined minimal requirements for ketogenic diet services in resource limited regions, accepting we don't have full resource everywhere. These papers deal with um, issues such as patient selection, who in whom should we be deciding on, and indeed what should be considered in pre-diet evaluation and counselling, and also on diet selection dependent on the presentation of the individual and perhaps the usual dietary basis or, or what is in the usual diet of that individual. There, will then, there is also then um, guidance or recommendations with regard to diet provision and initiation, and particularly with regard to the fact that there will need to be an individual calculation based on the calorie intake of that individual on a usual day-to-day -day basis. Uh, recommendations about concurrent anti-epileptic drugs. We don't have any significant evidence to suggest there being pharmacodynamic interactions um, between the diet and conventional anti-epileptic drugs. However, we do need to be aware of possible similar side effects with certain drugs used in conjunction with the ketogenic diet, such as zanisamide uh, to pyramate, where there is also a degree of carbonic anhydrase inhibition and indeed a tendency to acidosis. In our experience now with more frequent use of cannabidiol, I have seen an increased ketosis in these individuals, so we may need to tailor the diet accordingly. And there is also some concern perhaps about valparate. Could this be contradict, uh, uh, contraindicated um, in the diet? And certainly this may need to be met on an individual basis, individual 
by individual, case by case basis. Although in my experience, sometimes if they're on the keep of valparate, albeit it may affect chesosis, but also weaning of valparate ultimately may enhance um, uh, uh, effect of the diet, although this is anecdotal. What about supplementation? Well, on the basis of the recommendations, yes, there needs to be um, multivitamin and mineral supplementation and adequate vitamin D for that individual. There's no evidence for empiric use of antacids, laxatives, or indeed carnitine, and no consensus on empiric use of citrates, although many of us would think that, as I'll come to in a minute, that um, very young non-ambulant individuals probably do justify a prolactic use of citrates. And it is widely accepted that there needs to be regular monitoring of individuals who remain on the ketogenic diet. Of course, that may be daily with regard to the family, um, checking on ketosis. Many centres now utilise blood um, ketones, utilising um, meters and strips, um, although some families still prefer to utilise urine analysis. There needs to be ongoing contact with the diet team, review by the multidisciplinary team at 1, 3, 6, 9 and 12 months over the first year of utilisation of the diet, and each visit checking on the nutritional content of the diet, laboratory investigations, anti-seizure, anti-epileptic medication use, and ketogenic diet therapy duration review. Namely, do we still need to utilize the diet or should we be considering a wean? And indeed, this was never been thought to be a lifelong treatment. Um, uh, certainly we would review benefit over a three month period in the first instance. If no benefit seen, then consideration of withdrawal at that point. But if it is effective, consideration given as to when ultimately we trial a further wean, perhaps at two years. And 80% of the individuals, if there's been a benefit, then we are able to wean the diet. But in a small number, it may need to be continued. And at each evaluation, there needs to be a consideration of the risk benefit to continuing the diet. So what about barriers to implementation? Well, there are many different barriers or even things we need to consider on deciding whether a ketogenic diet therapy is the right way to move forward. There is still a widespread physician perception of poor impalatability and the difficulties of implementing a ketogenic diet. There is a constant request for data as to what the relative benefit is relative to other anti-epileptic drugs. But you could argue, particularly in the very young, we don't have much in the way of data with regard to anti-epileptic drugs and treatment of different epilepsy syndromes. There is also a perception about the safety and the worry about side effects. And also where diagnosis may be unclear, what are the risks of initiating a diet if there is a metabolic derangement? There are also various perceptions on the part of the family, perhaps um, less so now with the internet and discussion over the internet. But, also, but there is concern about restriction of the diet, the practicality of how you administer it, the, the implications for the family and the family dynamics, the palatability to the child, and the possibility of adverse effects. And of course, there is a resource required. This is not something we could just prescribe. It needs to be carefully calculated and monitored by a ketogenic diet team, not least the dietitian. There are, of course, various metabolic contraindications to administering a ketogenic diet, primarily the, those um, conditions where glucose really is required um, for continued maintenance of metabolic um, uh, stability. And certainly beta oxidation defects, pyruvate carboxylase deficiency are two of these metabolic um, problems, and these need to be um, ruled out prior to commencing a ketogenic diet. And there is also the concern about side effects. What side effects may we expect? And certainly we cannot ignore the fact that side effects may occur. As I said at the beginning, this is a treatment by which you may use natural products, but it is not a natural diet. Certainly there is a worry about metabolic abnormalities, but these are usually very minor, um, particularly if we've ruled out those metabolic defects where there's a contraindication. The most common side effects are gastrointestinal, and the majority of which will be alleviated with dietary modification. Renal calculi do occur in three to seven percent, 
And usually we can treat um, with utilization of citrates um, and it rarely requires diet discontinuation, but we do need to monitor for this. There is concerns about growth, particularly in the small children. And these, uh, this is the main longer term side effects. There are minimal data on long term effects, as I said, as many of these individuals who trial the diet, even with benefit, come off the diet after a short term. When we did our randomized control trial, actually comparing not only the ketogenic diet therapy versus no change in treatment, but when in the ketogenic diet group, they were also randomized to receive either an MCT or a classical diet. We found very little difference in the degree of side effects that were actually um, seen. Vomiting occurred a little more in um, uh, the classical diet. Uh, lack of energy, again, a little more in the classical diet. Um, it's difficult to quantify these. The reports were of any vomiting. Um, and so even a vomiting once would have been reported. Most of the symptoms could actually, or the side effects could be alleviated with dietary modification. On further evaluation of who may be at risk of renal stones, this study from the Johns Hopkins um, uh, Hospital um, showed that those who are very young and indeed who have a uh, demonstrated health of calcuria are those more at risk to develop renal stones. So this where um, children uh, perhaps under the age of three, we would consider um, citrate prophylaxis in those on a classical ketogenic diet. And with regard to growth, what is found is that actually growth is slowed whilst on the diet. And it's more obvious the younger the child. The Z scores deviating away from the norm um, to a greater degree, the younger the diet um, has been initiated. That aside, once they stop the diet, there is growth catch up. This doesn't appear to be related to protein intake, possibly related to the mild acidosis and the effect on bone growth that this may have. But certainly once they wean the diet, then there does appear to be catch up growth and they don't stop growing altogether. And the other concern, particularly when we're trialing this diet in the older individual or even the adult, it's a derangement of lipids and lipid profiles. And you can see from this study um, from Mackenzie Savenka and colleagues is that yes, about um, 20 to 30% may show a derangement of um, lipid profile. And in, although we find in the children that these may, um, after the initial three months, may then subsequently normalize. The uh, consequences of a high of a deranged liver profile in children is unclear in the longer term, and particularly when you trial the diet for a specific, specified period of time. But the study on the right did look at endothelial function, looking at um, arterial wall um, distensibility, and demonstrated that with higher cholesterols, there was a degree of stiffness of the arterial walls, and this could imply um, there was a risk of longer term vascular problems. But of course, when we suggest um, initiating the diet, it is quite um, an onerous uh, burden on the families, and they do have to think about how they manage to do that. And certainly, I think many of the families and mothers particularly, yes, some fathers are those that cook, um, uh, may feel they're juggling everything and, and, and having to implement a special diet in one child may be an additional burden. Originally, and looking at a classical diet, then it may have been seen to be pretty boring, pretty unpalatable. How can you, um, if you're given specific calculations, how can you make that palatable for the child? But I think with the help of um, many different organizations, now not least Matthew's Friends, as an example, Charlie Foundation, um, new, um, and many numerous cookery books, then actually um, the diet can be made very varied and indeed highly palatable. Interestingly, um, uh, Natasha Schuller, who uh, works with me at UCL, um, looked at a, um, an attitudes to medicine questionnaire and adapted it um, to uh, implement in a series of families who had um, started the ketogenic diet in one of their children and demonstrated that if there actually was a high necessity score, so the family perceived 
the treatment was required, then they were more likely to have a child who responded to the diet. Whereas if the concern score was high, namely that they had a high degree of skepticism with regard to the diet, then they were less likely to have a child who would respond to the diet. Showing perhaps there does need to be a degree of commitment uh, and that the belief that this diet is required in order to ensure, ensure success. But do we have further information about in whom the diet is best used? Is there a degree of epilepsy syndrome specific efficacy? We could argue that we need to consider the, the, the diet in any child with ongoing seizures who has failed two anti-epileptic drugs or two anti-seizure medicines. But can we have any handle on who is more likely to respond? Certainly there is an increasing number of metabolic diseases in which reports of benefit to the ketogenic diet have been demonstrated. Of course, there are um, metabolic diseases where we are looking at the underlying um, problem and perhaps targeting that, not least providing an alternative fuel for the brain over and above the glucose that cannot be taken up, whether that be GLUC1 deficiency or indeed pyruvate decarb um, dehydrogenase deficiency. But whereas previously it was felt that perhaps in mitochondrial disorders that may be contraindicated, we now realize that benefit can be demonstrated and there is mechanistic action that may be um, uh, show why that is the case. And also some degree of benefit has been shown in glycogen storage disorders. And there are a range of other metabolic diseases where symptoms have been treated successfully with the ketogenic diet as shown on the right. With regard to epilepsy syndromes, there has been benefit demonstrated in spasms, whether newly diagnosed or indeed drug resistant to standard therapy. Dravet syndrome, again, compared to sub what we consider suboptimal treatment without steropentol or indeed following optimal treatment with steropentol, clobazam, and sodium valproate. Lennox Gasto syndrome, um, this showing that you um, can still see similar numbers of portions of benefit, even though there may be a multitude of different causes here. And epilepsy with um, myoclonic atonic seizures has been shown to have a very specific responsiveness perhaps more of a response to the ketogenic diet over and above other standard anti-epileptic medications. And even a suggestion from one study about early use being associated with improved cognitive outcome. There is a report um, from um, the Australian group of suggesting that actually in a proportion of those that respond promptly, they may have an underlying glucose transporter defect. However, this does not appear to be the total story. Um, uh, and, and therefore, it, it still recognised that this group of patients show particular response, response to the ketogenic diet, but there doesn't appear at the present time to be a, a, a mechanistic action that can explain this for all. Of course, that comes down to the other um, aspect, and namely, how is the diet working? And of course, I think that is it, it, we had a multitude of different actions that have been put forward, but let's look at the um, uh, classification framework of the epilepsies to see if we can get further insight as to who may or may not respond. Certainly the etiology or the cause of the epilepsy is gaining uh, more, uh, is becoming more important, particularly in the more complex epilepsies, responsible of course not only for the seizures but also the comorbidities that may be seen alongside that. And of course the glucose transporter defects falling into the genetic etiology, an example where we're targeting the etiology with the ketogenic diet in order to gain improvements. GLUT1, one of nine glucose transported waters coded for by the SRC2A1 gene. And of course, we know that this can um, present in a wide range of different ways. We can have the early neonatal form with the poor prognosis with regard to neurodevelopmental outcomes, seizures um, in the longer term. There's early onset absence epilepsy, other types of epilepsy, and also later onset movement disorders. Recognizing that glucose cannot be taken up into the brain, treatment with a ketogenic diet, reducing ketones could be seen as a treatment of choice here. And certainly in the study, looking at response to the ketogenic diet, 
86% of those with epilepsy as a clinical manifestation appeared to respond. And there is also some data now to suggest that the earlier we diagnose this and treat with a ketogenic diet, it's not just the seizures we're treating, but we also are improving cognitive outcome longer term. What about other genetic disorders? Can we see any other genetic basis to a response to the ketogenic diet? Well, thinking that maybe many of those that are dramatic responders may be undiagnosed as, diagnosed cases of GLUT1. Natasha Schiller again evaluated 246 cases and actually only found one new case of SLC2A1 mutation in that cohort. So again, this isn't the whole explanation for a response. She also looked at some candidate genes with regard to reviewing a possible response, such as KCNJ11 or in BAD, but did not find any um, significant association with these genes with regard to response. We do, however, know that in structural epilepsies, however, particularly um, beneficial response may be seen. The study on the left showing a particular response of the ketogenic diet to the ketogenic diet in individuals with focal malformations of cortical development, um, showing that almost 50% at three months from treatment of the ketogenic diet were indeed seizure-free, and that 20% demonstrated long-term um, seizure freedom at follow-up, even on weaning of the diet. And then a small study on the right showing that the children with post um, acquired structural injury epilepsy also showed a particular beneficial response on collated data. Randomized controlled trials have predominantly involved children in the mid age range, 2 to 16, 2 to 14. What about the very young population or indeed adolescents and adults? Well, there's long been a belief that infants may respond particularly well. And our data in anti-epileptic drugs per se traditionally have not been great with regard to epilepsy onset in the first two years of life. These two open label studies demonstrating particular benefit in infants that may be seen to be um, higher than uh, in the degree of responders than we may see in older children. We are currently conducting a randomized controlled trial of children under the age of two in, with epilepsy and continuing seizures despite treatment with two anti-epileptic drugs. So this includes spasms who have not responded to vigabatrin and steroids. And this has been a slow study to recruit to, not an easy study to perform, at least the perception that um, children of this age need rapid changes in their anti-epileptic treatment, the need to control seizures, difficulties in achieving a baseline, or even that the relatively late coming to the study after a trial of four, five, six medications, and therefore a belief that the ketogenic diet is the way to go, and therefore the lack of possibility to randomize. But at the present time, we are randomizing. Dropouts are relatively small. And now, um, earlier in the year, we would got up to patient 113. Unfortunately, COVID has put a pause on our recruitment. We're just about to start again. And hopefully, we will get to 120, 120 five patients to give us 80% power. This looking at ketogenic diet versus the next um, uh, suitable anti-epileptic drug. However, there is also some evidence in this for a study from Austria, looking at the utilization of ketogenic diet and looking at the differential across the age range and suggesting that actually the earlier we use the diet in the management of the epilepsy, the more likely there will be a response, certainly showing they divided it into two groups, group A, under the, where the diet was initiated under the age of 18 months, and uh, group B, where they were over the age of 18 months. And you can see they were more likely to be seizure-free at, at three and six months if the diet was initiated under the age of 18 months. And also, there was a likelihood of longer-term seizure freedom. And now we actually have guidelines, as uh, led by Ellis van der Lau, um, published now four years ago, in order to give a, a advice on how to administer the ketogenic diet in the very young, even when they're breastfed, um, and, and indeed whether it be from the initiation 
um, whether the monitoring that's required and actually the dietary requirements. And what about the other end of the spectrum of the age range and adults? And when we looked at this in 2011, we actually could only find a minimal number of adults and adolescents that had been used, um, treated with a ketogenic diet in an open label fashion. But at that time, we demonstrated that the effects were similar to children that, that were seen in children. And the main reason for discontinuation was lack of efficacy. This is a meta-analysis meta of observational studies in adults published two years ago. Again, demonstrating that there were a proportion that became seizure-free, um, with also 53% had seizure reduction by more than 50%. And there were adverse reactions, but they were mild. What this study showed was that the, uh, uh, um, a more relaxed diet is likely to lead to greater compliance, but lesser efficacy. And in adults, so certainly compliance is an issue. What they're trying to, they need to see significant benefit in order to continue in view of the change there would be to um, their day-to-day -day life. This is a randomized controlled trial recently published, um, undertaken in Norway. And unfortunately, they had to stop this prior to achieving the recruitment required for the power of the study in view of the length of time that it had taken to recruit to the study. It took up to six years um, to achieve the number of patients, 277 were assessed for eligibility, 129 did not meet the inclusion criteria and 73 declined even after meeting um, inclusion criteria. So in the end, there were 32 patients in the control group and 24 patients in the diet group. And indeed, although they can see that there's some patients who would appear to have a dramatic change in seizure frequency on the ketogenic diet, looking at the group data, there was so, no significant difference in seizure reduction between the two. Certainly, one discussion of implementation in adults may need to rethink the way that we, we do this, not from the traditional um, way that we would administer in children. And certainly here you have um, a suggestion of actually um, utilizing email management to make it more feasible and effective um, for adults with modified ketogenic diet. And here, improving compliance, utilizing supplementation um, with a ketocal or ketogenic diet supplementation to see um, more readily whether ketosis can be achieved and indeed whether there can be a benefit. But um, those treated with the um, uh, supplement had no greater likelihood of response, but actually significantly more adults remained on the modified diet longer term. So achieving that compliance in the longer term. And we move forward with trying to think of other ways of implementing the treatment. Long have we said, can we give the ketogenic diet in a pill form or a simpler form? And because of the various ways we have um, perceived the mechanism of action, that doesn't seem to have been possible. However, these studies have demonstrated that medium chain um, fatty acids, namely decanoic acid to C10 fatty acids, not only in vitro have shown um, the anti-epileptic effects, much more, um, more than uh, sodium valparate, but also another group in London um, showing that uh, looking at markers of mitochondrial function, namely citrate synthase activity, showing in a, a cellular model that this can be markedly increased with treatment with C10 decanoic acid. And indeed the electron micrograph shows the untreated on the left and the treatment on the right, showing a dramatic increase in the number of uh, mitochondria this put forward as a possible mechanism of action with regard to the anti-seizure effect. Natasha Schuller and colleagues reviewed um, uh, carnitine lab profiles um, with regard to response to the ketogenic diet and demonstrated that acetyl carnitine at baseline was significantly higher in respondents, recognizing that carnitine quite is required particularly in the classical diet, for uptake of fat and, and um, uh, raw material into the mitochondria. However, um, again, the group that had originally been looking at compounds comparing to valparate, this is the group of um, at the Royal Holloway in London, showed that actually um, decanoic acid can be seen 
um, to have a very similar action to parampanil, namely as a non-competitive um, AMPA antagonist. And again, another way that it could be anti-seizure in its effect. And we've teamed up with Vitaflow, um, a nutrition company, to produce a C10-based product that was, we've trialed in tolerability trials um, and have some good preliminary results with regard to tolerability. So what about dietary therapies? Where are we now in the treatment of epilepsy? Well, there's no doubt that ketogenic diet therapies are an established therapy in childhood epilepsy. And we've got increasing evidence for extending out that use into adulthood, but also um, into and um, utilizing it as early as possible in infancy. We do have some evidence that it can be utilized across a wide range of different syndromes, some more than others and also at some specific etiologies where we might consider it earlier in the anti-epileptic therapy regime. And as we gain more of an understanding of response, that may enhance our understanding and management of the epilepsis. There is global acceptance. It gives us an enhanced choice of what we can utilize in the treatment, particularly of complex epilepsy, although it does require resource. It requires dietary monitoring and also the ketogenic diet uh, team. And therefore, and in adults, this can be a barrier in view of the fact that dietitians aren't necessarily part of an adult team, and that requires additional resource. However, as we move forward, we gain insight into the underlying mechanisms of action, leading into translation of new therapies into clinical practice, where we hope we will move forward over the next five to 10 years. Uh, first, uh, sorry, uh, not to... Uh, to have introduced you in the bar in the uh, at the beginning, I don't know. Do, would you like to do it now? No, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. It's uh, a clear, uh, splendid talk. Very nice. Uh, we do have some uh, uh, question. I do have one question first. If a patient is on uh, uh, topiramate for epilepsy. Is it a contraindication? Uh, because it might increase its uh, renal calculi. I wouldn't regard um, it as a contraindication. Um, certainly, we have to be more observant as to whether um, calculi ha ha have developed. In the children, they don't tend to get big stones that you would expect, you know, that cause renal colic. It's more like crystals in the urine. But that aside, we would test um, urine on a three monthly basis for blood. And if we had three consecutive um, uh, positives, then we would organize a renal ultrasound. And I would organize, if a, an individual was on topiramate, then I would organize a renal ultrasound prior to initiating the diet to check that they had not got any evidence of that in the first instance. So no, I wouldn't regard it as a contraindication. If the topiramate hadn't been of help and the ketogenic diet was, then it would be the first one I would anti-epileptic I would try and wean um, but that aside I've got children who've continued on both who've just been careful for monitoring for renal renal calculi. Thank you. I have a second question. I think uh, two people have asked this question already. Is there any uh, place for ketogenic diet in uh, status epilepticus? And I would say, answer yes and I think Increasingly, we have been utilizing the ketogenic diet, particularly with refractory status epilepticus. So where they've been admitted um, to the intensive care unit and where they haven't, um, uh, whether they've perhaps been put on a barbitric coma um, and haven't been able to be weaned from that first time or whether they failed um, second line medication. There are concerns that perhaps, you know, will it be absorbed? How can we administer it? We administer down nasogastric tube and therefore utilizing it earlier in status epilepticus is perhaps more advantageous because there's less concern about the fact the gut may have gone into ileus after a prolonged period on ITU, there gets concerns about gut function. However, um, it can be given, um, ketogenic diet can be given preventrally, but I think this may be utilized more frequently when individuals are on a ketogenic diet and require um, periods nil by mouth. But in the treatment of status epilepticus, certainly we've used it enterally um, and, and increasingly it's been utilized um, both in adults and children. Ah, thank you. Uh, I think you answered this question. I saw it uh, many times. Is there any 
diet restriction uh, when we start a ketogenic diet? Should we? Yeah. We well, certainly, we don't far, well, depends how the, the diet is going to be administered. We, um, in our clinic, we administ we initiate it as an outpatient unless the child is un under one. We don't fast to initiate the diet and there's no fluid restriction. In the older um, administrate, in the older, we'll say 10 years ago when it was gaining um, momentum, there was a protocol, particularly from Johns Hopkins, and this is somewhere that's got an enormous amount of experience, that would fluid restrict to 75% of fluid within butin diets and the diet. We don't do that. We don't restrict fluids and we don't fast on administration of the diet. So the only dietary restriction really would be if they've already got a dietary problem. And we can utilize, I mean, if you think about it, yes, it's easier if they aren't, um, you can administer it as, as dairy free, but it's more difficult, um, you know, in, in or, you know, if you've got an individual who's dairy intolerant, or milk intolerant. Um, but certainly the only, um, the, one thing I will mention is that um, people worry about behavior disorder and being contraindications to diet. Behaviour disorder per se doesn't. Where individuals have got specific issues around eating, that can be problematic. And not least textures. Some children, particularly children with multiple disabilities, may have problems with specific textures, and that can be problematic for administrating the diet. Okay, another question is, uh, if uh, relapse uh, occur after discontinuation of uh, uh, ketogenic diet, should we reinitiate it? Start it uh, again? Of course. Yeah, I mean, when we initiate the diet, you know, we look for a response. And if there's been no response after a three, four month um, spit period and the diet has been optimized, then we would wean quite quickly. And then people ask, how long do you continue the diet for? And we usually go for no more than two years before trying to wean. And 80% of individuals will come off the diet without a problem, even though we've weaned the diet. There seems to be some degree of disease modification. But there are some individuals who on attempting to wean the diet do get an exacerbation of seizures. And in then we have to weigh up the risk benefit of continuing the diet. And some, you know, yes, we do reinstitute the diet and get benefit again. And they may go longer before we try and wean again. But, you know, we are constantly weighing up the risk benefit to continuing the diet. What are the risk of side effects versus the benefit of actually achieving better seizure control? And I have got albeit a handful of children, only a small number of children who've carried on for five, six, seven years on the diet because that's the optimal treatment and they are so much better on the ketogenic diet. When we try and wean it, then they get a seizure exacerbation. Very good. Uh, on another question, is a patient on another uh, approach, another kind of uh, uh, palliative uh, treatment like uh, vagal nerve stimulation, can we can we add can we add a ketogenic diet? Absolutely, and in fact, there's some data that's almost an additive effect. You know, you get some benefit from the vagal nerve stimulation, and then further benefit from ketogenic diet. So, being on vagal nerve stimulation, there, there isn't any real treatment that's contraindicating contraindicated in administering a ketogenic diet, um, and certainly you can see additive effects. I think you answered already this question. I saw it many times. How long should we keep? Uh, giving uh, a ketogenic diet? How long? Three well, months? One year? In order to assess for benefit, it usually takes three, four months um, because you need to optimize the diet for that particular individual. If there's been no benefit after that period of time, then it's unlikely there's going to be any benefit, benefit longer term and therefore we would be in the diet. You know, traditionally we've said try the diet for two years and then try and wean it if there's been benefit. Some children don't get there, especially some of the children with epilepsy of myoclonic astatic seizures. They, they may try it for a year and then do they need to continue it? And some can wean at that point. But traditionally, we try for two years. You know, if they've had benefit, we utilize it for two years and then we discuss, discuss um, trying a wean. Okay. Another interesting question. If we stop uh, a ketogenic diet in a Glutamine uh, one deficiency. Uh, is, uh, is there any chance that the seizure became refractory? You mean in glut one deficiency? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
yes. <laughs> you know, we have children who come to us who haven't been diagnosed and their seizures have not responded to anti-epileptic drugs. And we diagnose the GLUT1 deficiency and they get a much better response to ketogenic diet. So they may be refractory to the medication, but they still may respond to a ketogenic diet. The main reason, I mean, others ask um, if they've got seizure control with a medication and GLUT1 deficiency, should they go on a ketogenic diet? And I think in young children, the answer would still be yes. In adults, it's more of a discretionary discussion, I think, with the family. But in children, we, we know that actually they get impaired cognition if they continue to have um, without um, benefit. And the ketogenic diet, there's some evidence that if you start it early, uh, um, get response to the seizures, then also their cognitive outcomes are improved. And even those that we've started later, they get much more um, better cognitive performance if they're on a ketogenic diet than if not. So I think you're not only treating the seizures, you're treating the other neurological manifestations of GLUT1 deficiency when you utilize a ketogenic diet. Thank you. Another question, <laughs> too many questions. From your experience, does ketogenic diet alter the plasma level of phenobarbitone? It will change, does it change the level of phenobarbitone? We've got no evidence that that indeed occurs. No, no. Okay, that's fine. Another question. How, do, how is the weaning process of ketogenic diet? Do you switch to normal diet immediately or in slower process? Okay. It's a slower process and it's usually, it depends what type of diet that they may be on as to how you wean it. <laughs> on a classical diet, you may reduce the ratio slowly of fat to carbohydrate, including protein. So if they're a four to one diet, in the first instance, you may go down to 3.75, then 3.5. And how quickly you do it probably depends in some degree on the response they've had and how, um, uh, how long they've been on it. So if they've only been on it three months and it's had no benefit, you'll probably be able to wean it over a two to three week period. If they've been on it two years and they had a real benefit from the diet, then you're gonna wean it over a three to four month period. An MCT diet, you're probably just going to slowly reduce the percentage of fat as medium chain triglyceride. Sometimes we just um, substitute snacks to start with, with a normal snack and then reduce the meals. It may depend from child to child and also on the type of diet that they have been on. Very good. Another question, too many questions. <laughs> Another question, do you have any data on a patient being just on ketogenic diet only, not yes. for seizure control, not uh, on anti-epileptic drugs. Yes. Now, if you're talking about, you know, we regard the ketogenic diet as another anti-epileptic therapy. Some children who we start on it have been on medications in the past and their families have decided it's not been of benefit and we've therefore just started the ketogenic diet. Others, if we see benefit from the diet, then from the dietary therapy, then we slowly wean the other medications um, because they haven't been as beneficial, just like we would if we had a successful anti-epileptic drug. So yes, you know, they do wean from medication and some children are maintained on a ketogenic diet only um, in their treatment. Oh, very nice. Another question I think is a good uh, answering. Is compliance to ketogenic diet a concern for you? What's that, compliance? Uh, 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 compliance. To ketogenic well, diet, is I it like anti-epileptic drugs? Yeah, I mean, this is what um, what we tried to study with the Attitudes to Medicine questionnaire, which actually was formulated for looking at um, compliance with anti-epileptic drug therapy, looking at attitudes to therapy, whether there's concerns or a belief that it was going to work. And there's no doubt there is a relationship of its um, of response to positive attitude that it's going to be to work and that there's a lack of concern about the treatment, suggesting that families adhere to it more if um, they believe it's going to work and they feel um, that um, it's going to be safe. So I think, you know, one thing we can look at is ketones. We look at ketones in the urine or the blood and they monitor those daily when we're starting the diet and for at least a period of time following. If they're not ketotic, then it's unlikely they're complying with the diet. 
if they are have a degree of ketosis, then they are complying at least to some degree. So we, you know, most of them do undertake that. And if if they're finding it too difficult, then they will declare to us. It's not hidden like you have with the medication. What's interesting is actually um, those that we see intermittent compliance. So intermittent ketosis, usually related, and I'm not a grandparent, so I'm not gonna be rude, but you know, grandparents come around, they feel sorry for them, they give them a sugar biscuit or something, not realizing the importance of the ketogenic diet. So there does need to be a belief across all the family that this is the way to go. Thank you. Uh, another interesting question coming from Dr. Anya Madominic from Cameroon. She or he uh, is asking of, uh, if you know a center practicing ketogenic diet in Central Africa, uh, they, uh, she or he would like to connect with them. Sure. But, uh, he would like to start uh, some ketogenic diet, yeah. Sure. Well, I know that um, there is a very active dietitian who is trying to branch out and, and communicate with as many centers as possible in Africa, from South Africa. That's Kath McGraw. And also, I know they're establishing ketogenic diets in Kenya. Um, and these are two contacts I know. There are other countries. But certainly, um, I could put, you know, Kath McGraw in South Africa would know um, most of the, the, the centers that may be implementing the diet and, and be able to put them in touch with the appropriate, um, appropriate center. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, I think you answered, uh, you have already answered this question from Dr. Fouaz Ahmed. Among the contraindications for ketogenic diet, do you recommend to rule out porphyria in all cases? Porphyria. porphyria out... not, unless there's no particular symptomatology to suggest that, no. The only um, things that I would do to make absolutely certain there was not a contraindication would be organic acids of the urine, to looking for beta oxidation defects and organic acid urease. You know, those, that would be an absolute contraindication. Many of the other metabolic defects, you, they will be, um, have other symptoms suggestive of that and therefore may have been ruled out before, including um, porphyria. But, um, you know, it's look, making sure that they haven't got a beta oxidation defect because of the risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, thank you very much. I think I summarized all questions. All questions, there is no more. Okay, okay. thank you thank for you. this uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very no much. No problem. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for this interesting talk. Um, uh, I think it's now uh, the turn to next talk. Uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Waid uh, Al-Jinbil. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, Baghdad Medical College uh, at 1977 and King's College London Hospital, the UK, at uh, 2007. He's also a senior uh, lecturer and member of teaching faculty of Iraqi uh, Council for Medical Speciali Specialization in Iraqi Boards of Neurology. He's board member of uh, IAE uh, in our ex uh, executive committee for two Terms, and he is uh, also, uh, of course, a consultant epileptologist uh, in Iraq. Uh, so uh, you can uh, start, uh, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rin. Thank you, Dr. Rin. Uh, I will start uh, now the lecture about classification of neonatal uh, uh, seizures, and I will receive uh, definitely the questions after the end of this uh, lecture. Hi everyone. Uh, our subject today is the classification of neonatal seizures based on International League Against Epilepsy 2017 seizure classification. Uh, this the LA Commission on Classification and Terminology uh, recognize that seizures in the neonatal period require special considerations and therefore a task force was established with the aim of integrating seizures and epilepsies in this age group uh, into the LA 2017 classification. The presentation is simply to throw light on the fabulous job of this task force. Uh, definitions. For the purpose of this report, the following defi definitions are used. 
gestational age, which is the most important, time elapsed between the first day of the last menstrual period and the day of uh, delivery. While PMA, post-menstrual age, is the gestational age plus the chronological age uh, in weeks, that is the age after delivery. Consumptional age is the age from conception, uh, that is to say, the post-menstrual age minus two weeks. The preterm infant is the infant born before, <clears throat> at or before 37 weeks. Uh, while the neonatal period is the period from birth up to 28 days, four weeks in term neonates, while from birth to up to 44 weeks of PMA, post menstrual age and preterm uh, neonates. Well, the seizures are the most important uh, common neurological emergency in the neonatal period, as you know all. The majority of neonatal seizures are symptomatic uh, and are of an acute illness, illness with an underlying etiology usually. But uh, epilepsy syndromes may present in this uh, neonatal uh, period. The main causes that account for most of the seizures uh, will be shown in the next figure. That is to say, uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the main uh, infarction and hemorrhage, uh, genetic, metabolic infections, uh, uh, brain malformations, etc. Well, uh, clinical diagnosis of neonatal seizures is difficult. Uh, and there's usually poor inter-observer agreement uh, independent of the observer's uh, specialty. The immature uh, state of the motor pathways in terms and the preterm neonates may account for some of the difficulty in, in differentiating seizures from non epileptic uh, movements. Well, uh, seizure burden is defined as electrographic seizures in minutes per hour. And there's evidence that electrographic seizures, uh, or electrographic seizure burden has a comparable effect on the outcome similar to the clinical or electroclinical uh, seizures. The LA defines a seizure as a transient occurrence of signs and symptoms, or both of them, due to abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neonatal activity uh, in the brain. Uh, electrographic only seizures are not included in this uh, definition, the, the definition of the clinical uh, seizures. Uh, neonatal seizures uh, historically are often categorized as clinical only, electroclinical, or electrographic only seizures. A clinical only seizure without a definite EEG association, an electroclinical seizure coupled with an electro graphic seizure, while an electrographic only seizure refers to the presence of a definite EEG seizure that is not associated with any evident uh, clinical uh, signs. Uh, the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society has recently defined electrographic neonatal seizure as a paroxysmal, abnormal, sustained change in the EEG characterized by a repetitive and evolving pattern with a minimum of two microvolt voltage and the duration of at least 10 seconds. This definition does not require any evident clinical uh, change. Historically, the classification proposed earlier before this classification is uh, included the following, the multifocal clonic, the vocal clonic, the tonic, myoclonic, and subtle uh, seizures. And this is the usual uh, classification which we uh, are using really in our daily uh, practice. Well, proposal, the goal of this report is to propose a classification of seizures in the neonates by the task force that emphasizes the key role of the age in the diagnosis and be acceptable to neonatologists, pediatricians, epileptologists, neurophysiologists, and neurologists as well and linked to 2017 LA operational seizure classification or epilepsy classification later on. Next slide shows the proposed approach for seizure classification. And this is the presentation 
is either clinical suspicion of a seizure or critically ill patient. Then by video EEG or integrated amplitude EEG, we will uh, find that there is, when they are without EEG correlates, there are non-seizure episodes, while if they are associated with EEG correlates, then they are seizures. These seizures are of two types, mainly with the clinical signs and without clinical signs. When they are without clinical signs, they are called electrographic only seizures. When they are with clinical signs, they will be one of the following. Two main types, the motor and non-motor. The motor is defined or subdivided into automatism, clonic, elliptic spasm, myoclonic, sequential, tonic, while non-motor into two types, autonomic and behavioral arrest. A third type is unclassified when the picture is not uh, very uh, clear. Well, the clinical events without an EEG correlates are not included in this proposed classification of this task force. Uh, as Caesar in the neonatal period have been shown to have a focal onset, so a division into focal and generalized uh, Caesar is unnecessary. This is the first step and the first difference from the LA classification uh, of adult uh, or uh, older uh, children. Uh, then uh, in neonates, of course, the video age recording is the, call, the gold standard for diagnosis, of course. Uh, a proportion of seizures are electrographic only, particularly in encephalopathic and criti critically ill patients. They are mainly electrographic. Uncoupling may increase after administration of anti seizure medication, especially phenobarbital. Therefore, this will increase the chance of electrographic only seizure, and therefore, electrographic only seizure should be part of the classification. The second step uh, about the aware and unaware that is impaired awareness seizures. This is not applicable, of course, in neonates, as it is not possible to confidently and reproducibly assess awareness and responsiveness in this age uh, group, so it is omitted. This is followed by the division into motor and then motor uh, seizures. In the early classification of uh, 2017, focal seizures are determined by the first feature. While seizures in neonates can present with a variety of clinical signs, in the majority of cases, a single predominant feature can be determined. This is the third step. To determine the predominant feature and, and note the first feature to be uh, registered. Uh, this predominant sign may or may not be, of course, the first clinical manifestation. For example, a neonate may present with a focal tonic posturing and in addition have some ocular myoclonus. This can still be defined as a tonic uh, seizure in spite of this ocular super added myoclonus. Uh, with uh, events with uh, a, a sequence of signs, symptoms, and EEG changes that change at different times have been described as a sequential seizure. And this was added to the seizure uh, times in this age group. Well, uh, of course, several seizure times described in the uh, LA classification cannot be diagnosed in a newborn, in newborns. Uh, for example, sensory seizures, they may appear in a neonate as just electrographic only events. Uh, awareness and responsiveness cannot be accurately assessed in neonate and hence not readily classified and it is omitted from the, the typing of the classification. Similarly, somatosensory or visual auras cannot be determined in neonates and so are omitted. And also, uh, and due to the relative low muscle tone and subine position of the newborn is always uh, lying, the occurrence of a tonic seizure cannot be evaluated clinically uh, without, of course, invasive uh, methods. So again, it is. These seizure types all 
are therefore not included in the proposed framework, and this is the, was the, first, uh, the fourth uh, step. Uh, motor scissor can be further, further classified using modalities listed in the following table, automatism, uh, clonic seizure, epileptic spasm, myoclonic seizure, sequential seizure types, and tonic seizures, uh, mostly with unilateral or bilateral, and when they are bilateral, maybe symmetric or asymmetric. Uh, ablution syndromes may present in the neonatal uh, age, and, uh, age period, and uh, there's mainly three types, uh, the self-limited uh, familial neonatal epilepsy, uh, the EMA, early myoclonic encephalopathy, and Otihara uh, syndrome. Well, uh, as Caesar was defined, uh, or Caesar was defined as an electrographic event with a pattern characterized by sudden repetitive evolving stereotyped waveforms. Ev evolving is very important with a beginning and end, which may or not may, uh, which may or may not be accompanied by paroxysmal uh, clinical changes. So no minimum duration was specified as long as there was sufficient demonstration of evolution in frequency and morphology of the discharge. The exception to the concept uh, evolving uh, are the myoclonic seizures and the spasms, which are associated both with an age correlate that is very brief and not evolving. Uh, the age was used to confirm that an event was uh, uh, an epileptic uh, seizure or is not an epileptic seizure. The results, a total of 147 seizures and 156 neonate was reviewed. Demographics are summarized in the following table. The common etiology in term infants was HIE, and in the B term was the vascular stroke or hemorrhage. This is the demographics of this uh, uh, job. The following table details the seizure types according to etiology, and this will we will uh, discuss it uh, now. Uh, the most common Caesar type was electrographic uh, only, both in term and preterm uh, infants. Most common type is the electrographic only Caesars. Uh, the most common etiologies of electrographic Caesars were HIE and infection. The uh, clonic Caesar were typically seen in association with vascular etiologies, term infants only while uh, tonic seizures and sequential seizures were most commonly observed in genetic uh, etiologies. Myoclonic seizures uh, were seen in the inborn error of uh, metabolism. Well, uh, all seizures in neonate with a genetic etiology had motor manifestation. Uh, automatism and behavioral arrest were uncommon as a dominant seizure manifestation in this age group. Uh, in the preterm infants, 70% of seizures were electrographic, regardless of etiology. Uh, no dominant seizure type was seen for acute metabolic disorders, cortical malformations, and unknown causes, but numbers, of course, were too small for comparison. Well, discussion in the neonates, the development with the limbic system with its connections to midbrain and the brainstem is more advanced than to the cortex. Uh, the Caesar type is typically determined by the predominant sign, as we uh, said earlier. Uh, predominant feature may provide clues regarding the etiology, and this is the reason why they prefer that the Caesar type is the, uh, the important uh, uh, sign here because there is, it gives some clues to the etiology. Uh, most units with genetic etiologies have tonic seizures or sequential seizures or both, whereas in preterm infants, regardless of etiology and neonates with HIE and infections present most commonly with electrographic only uh, seizures. Term infants with stroke are more likely to have focal clonic seizures. Myoclonic seizures are associated with inborn error of metabolism. So there is a clue or a relation between the predominant sign and the etiology. It has been suggested that rhythmic discharge of less than 10 seconds duration, so-called Baird's brief interictal rhythmic discharge, are associated with seizures in the same or subsequent 
EEG uh, recording. Uh, bears are defined as very brief, less than 10 seconds, runs of focal or generalized uh, rhythmic activity with or without evolution, with or without evolution, that are not consistent with any known normal or benign pattern. It has been suggested that definite bears with an evolution will represent very brief electrographic uh, uh, seizure, while those with no evolution are interepital uh, activity. Final framework of neonatal seizures is this, where there is seizure type, motor, and then motor, and electrographic. Uh, and there is no type of epilepsy here because all the seizures are regarded as focal. So the seizures or epilepsy is epilepsy with focal seizures when it is diagnosed. Uh, but we have epilepsy syndromes and we say that there are three. These are the etiology, the six uh, boxes of, of etiology where there is uh, uh, omission, omit the, they omit the immune box which is found in the uh, older children uh, because no place for immunity is regarded or proposed here. While they add the box, special box for hypoxic HIE uh, in the etiology. Uh, so hypoxic includes HIE and other hypoxic events in neonatal period. The structural box includes infarction, hemorrhage, brain tumor trauma, and brain malformation. Malformation are here uh, associated with or put together with the infarction and hemorrhage. Uh, there is no evidence at the present time that immune processes play a role in the etiology of this age group. So it was uh, omitted from the six boxes of uh, leaves. EEG is considered the gold standard for seizure diagnosis in the neonate, uh, but situations when the, uh, and where it is not readily available is the amplitude, integrated amplitude uh, EEG uh, may be uh, used, uh, although its limitations are uh, well uh, recognized and known. Uh, integrated EEG or cerebral function monitor, CFM, is widely available. Uh, interpretation using pat uh, patterns recognition can easily be learned by even the so it's rotators, but short seizure less than 30 seconds will not be detected. The movement artifacts are difficult to be excluded or may look like seizures. Uh, and then experts usually are prone to false negative uh, errors. This is the picture for this uh, uh, amplitude EEG or cerebral function monitoring. Uh, this is a picture for a normal trace. This is a normal trace. Uh, should we like the look or see the variation in the amplitude indicating, indicating sleep-wake uh, cycling? The upper margin, the normal is above 10. This is, this is 0, 4, 5, 10, 25, 50, and 100. Uh, so the upper margin more than 10, while the lower margin is above 5. This is the 5. The lower margin should be above 5, uh, and the upper margin should be above 10, so that to be regarded as normal uh, tracing. And the mean is around 25 microvolts. Uh, this is, again, uh, an example of the very normal uh, integrated EEG. And this is a, a, an example of the severely abnormal type of, uh, this trace is from an infant that suffered a severe asphyxial insult. Very narrow, very narrow, this is very narrow, uh, and suppressed, it's downwards, uh, band of activity uh, with occasional spikes indicating birth suppression. These spikes are indicating birth suppression. And we see that the lower margin is less than the five and the upper margin is less than 10. So it is abnormal uh, tracing. Uh, this is the picture for the adult or the elderly, or the, I mean older children, uh, where we five to three levels 
of classification, first level decision classification, focal onset, generalized onset seizure, and unknown. Then the second level is the epilepsy types, focal uh, seizure, epilepsy with focal seizure, epilepsy with generalized seizures. And the third category that is epilepsy with combined generalized and focal seizures. And the fourth category, the unknown. Uh, the fourth, of course, uh, level, or the third level, I mean, is the epilepsy uh, syndrome, which is seen in all neonate and uh, infancy, the childhood, adolescence, and adult adulthood. This is the com on the left side, the comorbidities, while on the right side is the boxes of uh, etiology, the structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, immune, and non all the same as in the neonate, but the immune is omitted. And it is, uh, uh, but uh, another tie, uh, the, the HIE put as a separate, uh, as a separate box. This is the already uh, mentioned, more, uh, only seizure type three type, motor and then motor and the ectographic, then the epilepsy syndrome, then the etiology. And uh, in conclusion, a new framework is proposed for seizures in neonates in keeping with 2017 uh, lay seizure classification while tailored to the neonatal uh, period. The framework emphasizes the necessity of EEG diagnosis of seizures in the neonate, uh, or neonatal period. Uh, seizure can occur with the clinical manifestations, motor or non-motor, or without clinical manifestation, that is electrographic only seizure. Uh, the circumstances are determined by the predominant uh, clinical feature and divided, as we said, into motor and non-motor uh, types. This is a com direct comparison between the two schemes for classification in neonate and adult. We signed here the seizure type, epilepsy type, epilepsy syndrome. Uh, comorbidity is the same, uh, while the seizure type here, only three, uh, those epilepsy types here were not included. Epilepsy syndrome is present. The six boxes are Again, six, but they are by hypoxic. The box is the first, and the immune box is uh, omitted. Well, if I, I, I don't have time, but uh, some criticism, uh, there are some suggestions and comments for this classification from where Dwight specials about the task. The task force, before uh, after completing the draft, which is uh, already uh, seen here in my lecture, uh, yeah, but but this uh, uh, <clears throat> draft uh, under the supervision of worldwide specialist and neurologist and uh, other specialties, and they have some type of uh, uh, suggestions, and I would read these suggestions in uh, my uh, five minutes, suggesting. Uh, one of them is suggesting a minimum time for this discharge may probably be, be more helpful. This is the time of 10 seconds. 10 seconds is not included in the definition of our task force. Uh, Why it was uh, uh, written or mentioned by the definition of the American uh, Clinical Neurophysiological uh, Society. Uh, another criticism that uh, um, from other neurologists, we propose to use the polygraphic video EEG emphasizing the study of the autonomic uh, functions of the neonate. Other emphasis should be placed cl uh, clinical classification rather than electrographic video EEG based classification. That's why, because neonatal EEG surface is not readily available in many uh, uh, intensive care units of neonate. Uh, this one, secondly, interpretation of neonatal EEGs is very subjective and mostly restrained due to lack of experience in therapeutics. And this is a worldwide uh, problem, really. I am not sure if the term generalized onset seizures of the new classification should be eliminated because these are observed, for example, in the epileptic syndromes. This is one comment. Other comment about bears or electrographic only seizures are more easily picked up in the severely encephalopathic infant since they stand out from suppressed uh, or discontinuous EEG, while in the healthier, perhaps more active infant, brief or very focal discharge may be hidden 
to algorithm or to the eye of the observer. Thus, the classification may be biased to the more severe uh, cases. This is one comment. Uh, other comments that the first symptoms versus most uh, prominent symptom. This is causing difficulties in the practice when looking at videos as the implications are different. Sequential, this term is rather confusing and will probably end up as a default state for seizures which cannot be accurately classified. Automatisms, most, most such events are not epileptic, so will cause confusion in the absence of uh, EEG. Uh, clinical only events. One inquiry that could we ignore this important section of events in a newborn only because they are not recognized by scalp EEG with all its uh, limitations? It seems convenient to consider adding uh, seizures with the clinical manifestations only, uh, especially when they appear in neonates with interictal paroxysmal activity in the EEG, and there is some traumatic etiology known. Uh, among the neonatal uh, epilepsy syndromes, epilepsy with the migrating focal seizure should also be included since it can have a, no, a neonatal onset as, as a fourth type of uh, syndrome. Neonatal status epilepticus, since this document highlights the role of EEG in neonatal seizures, so neonatal status epilepticus will be worth mentioning. To be consistent, please consider using 44 weeks uh, post menstrual uh, 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 age to define the end of the neonatal period for babies born at gestational at any gestational uh, age. Uh, I partially agree with the statement that most neonatal seizures are of focal origin. In and in pyridoxine dependent hyperglycinemia, the predominant seizure type will be generalized myoclonic, as well as an Otihara syndrome due to structural malformations, you may get a clinical generalized tonic class. So in his opinion, we can have focal, motor and motor, generalized and electrographic as the three major groups to begin with. In the etiology, it will be better to have vascular and structural as separate entities as the prognosis connotations and need for prolonged aid may be very different in a dysplasia versus uh, hemorrhagic uh, hemorrhage and stroke. Well, this is one of the suggestion of one of the neurologists when he put the same uh, diagram, but he put the epilepsy type. So these are types, so the focal and uh, will subdivide motor and then motor and clinical traffic. And this will be focal epilepsy, then the epilepsy syndrome, then the six uh, boxes of etiology and the comorbidity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Waeb, for this interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have uh, many questions here for you. Mm -hmm. The first question about the classification of the seizure type in your aid. Dr. Mahmoud, he asked uh, why you don't consider the only clinical seizure without any EG counterpart in the new classification? Uh, yes, it is the one of the uh, criticism and the uh, suggested uh, recommendations which I read already uh, that we uh, clinical early seizures are really uh, an important part in the neonatal seizures. Yeah. The other question uh, by Dr. John, uh, he asked, uh, do we classify based on the predominant feature or based on the first feature? I think you mean the seizure feature. Yeah, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the classification of the older children and adults, the most important is the, the initial uh, feature uh, of the seizure because it gives uh, a clue to the place where this uh, seizure starts from where visual area say, or frontal region or temporal, et cetera. Uh, this is, and the neonatal seizure, as in the, the opinion of this task force, is not uh, is taken in another way. That they uh, regard the predominant feature that it's repeated more and more than uh, not the first one, because 
it is not important that the place where the Caesar will start is not important as the etiology is important. They found a sort of etiology relation between the type of the predominant type of Caesars and uh, the uh, etiology. So they took or regard the predominant uh, and go to chronic type, tonic type, uh, sequential types, uh, etc. Uh, this is one of, again, uh, one of the criticism uh, and, and the recommendations. Also for me, it's not clear uh, what they mean by the sequential type. Sequential uh, means, uh, it, again, it's found in the new classification uh, for the adults and, and older children. Uh, when there is uh, different uh, female numerology and different EEG changes in the uh, and the Caesar, it is not uh, one type of Caesar. It is not one form of Caesar. It will take a uh, few uh, different uh, uh, shapes from one, uh, uh, changing from one to another with a different EEG change. It's called sequential type of Caesar. And it is included really in the new uh, classification of the uh, operation classic, uh, uh, Caesar classification of 2017. And okay. it is again included in, 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 uh, in neonates. Yeah. Very good, uh, Dr. Raed. There is also a, an interesting question um, about, uh, she asked about the seizure synology. She asked, uh, Dr. Sousan, uh, do you agree EEG is more important than semiology in seizure localization in neonates? Since seizure onset couldn't be uh, discerned most of the time. Well, uh, in the localization, uh, no, it is not very important really, or not very, very useful in, in, in localization. And the task force did not take this point in consideration. They are not considering the localization. They consider the etiology. So go to the, this uh, predominant uh, uh, feature. So the EEG is not, well, it's not very important really in, in localization in the uh, neonatal uh, region, in the neonatal uh, age. Definitely the clinical may be uh, even more important. Yes, thank you very much. Another question he asked about metabolic cause of neonatal seizure are common, such as hypoglycemia, uh, hypoxemia. Shouldn't this seizure be generalized rather than focal? Uh, well, uh, Hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia, you know, uh, these are metabolic uh, changes and they are usually considered, uh, may be related really with the generalized uh, seizure sometimes. But uh, this, the, the presence of generalized or focal seizure is a debate in this age group. Uh, this task force did not consider the generalized seizures, while really, in my opinion, for example, we have to consider it because we have myoclon myoclonic. Uh, in, uh, in Atihara, we have, my, we have uh, tonic seizures, which are generalized or focal. And we have in uh, EME, uh, we have the myoclonic, which are generalized. And say in pyridoxine uh, deficiency uh, seizures, they are usually generalized. And the, even the EG picture is a classical three cycle. Uh, so the, really, there is uh, generalized seizures. But the task force uh, really did not consider this. But there are some objections from other neurologists. Uh, really, I, I, what I did, did in my lecture is to uh, take the opinion of the task force and uh, project it to you. And then I took the uh, recommendations and the uh, suggestions or the objections of worldwide neurologists to this uh, uh, scheme of, of, uh, of classification. This scheme of classification is still really uh, in the progress. I, I think for two weeks, I received an email that they will they end uh, and the final draft of this classification will be pushed to epilepsy in a matter of one week or say. So we will we wait for this uh, final version in a matter of, of uh, a few weeks, I, I, I expect. 
Uh, excellent, uh, Dr. Waib. Uh, there is also uh, a lot of interesting question for you. Uh, so uh, also she asked about, could you mention example for subtle seizure? Yeah, uh, subtle seizure is one of the older classification of neonatal seizures. We have uh, classification of, of, of uh, neonatal seizure by Volv 1997. He put the subtle seizure, the first one, then the chronic seizure, the tonic seizures and the myotonic seizures. And this is very practical really in our daily uh, uh, practice. Uh, subtle seizures mean when you have some changes in say an eye closure, then he, uh, eye, eye uh, pace deviation, uh, then movement of one hand. Uh, so some sort of uh, remote uh, uh, changes uh, in different places of the body, say sometimes uh, even apnea maybe some sort of this uh, uh, subtle seizure. There are seizures which are not very clear to the eye, but they are uh, seizures. This subtle seizure is omitted in, uh, in the new classification and even substituted by other types, uh, say automatism, it, uh, it was one part of this subtle seizure uh, uh, and uh, uh, sequential may be one of this subtle seizure uh, there are two seizures, two type seizures, uh, 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 in addition to the cl uh, classical, uh, to the spasm, generalized spasm. So there are three with the th older three that is tonic, clonic, and myoclonic. So there are now six types of, of neonatal uh, seizures. Yeah, a continuation for the same uh, question about the subtle seizure. She asked where to put apnea in the classification. And what is the most common uh, neurological etiology for apnea? Well, apnea is put uh, in the, um, really it was one of the, uh, in, in the subtle seizures first was uh, regarded in one of subtle seizures. Uh, and the now in the uh, new classification, it may be not very easy to put it. It is not clonic, it is not tonic, uh, it is not uh, myoclonic. It is not sequential, maybe part of a sequential when it is uh, uh, associated with other uh, with, with other uh, uh, seizures. Uh, but it was one of the, that's why I believe that subtle seizure, in my opinion, is uh, an important uh, type or important name uh, for, for, for neonatal uh, uh, seizures. Well. Yeah. Uh, another question about also sequential seizure. Uh, he asked, uh, what's the difference between sequential seizure and migratory? And migratory, uh, the migratory is one type. Say it is migratory uh, uh, clonic or migratory myoclonic. It is myoclonic, but it's migrating from left hand to the left uh, leg, uh, to the right hand, to the right leg. It is one type. The sequential, no, it is not one type. It's different types, maybe clonic here, then tonic, uh, then it is a spasm. So it is a changing uh, shape and changing type of seizure. Uh, and some people regard it as, as multiple seizures, but uh, this task force put it as one seizure under the name of sequential uh, seizures. Could it be a localization maybe migratory from the right to the left? Could be also named as migratory seizure? Yeah, migratory, when it may be yes, from the right to the left. Yeah. Although you know, you know the, in the neonate, the communication is not very, uh, very uh, mature, but there are, yes, I think. Yeah, so. mostly children. Yeah. Another question uh, he asked How would a non motor seizure in a neonate present? I think oh, we answer this. Yeah, yeah, two types of yes, two types of uh, non-motor seizure. That is the autonomic uh, seizure and the behavioral arrest. Two types: behavioral arrest and autonomic uh, seizures. Both are non-motor seizures. While the motor seizure are six types, as we say uh, before, both of them are the clonic seizures uh, on one side, and on the other side is the electrographic uh, only uh, seizure. Okay, very interesting. Uh, there is also a practical question uh, from Dr. Zahra. 
He asked, when you prescribe vitamin B6 and folinic acid in a neonatal seizure? No, when we consider, no, when we uh, expect uh, pyridoxine 6 uh, deficiency seizure, we have to use it. The recommendation is that in any type of uh, refractory neonatal seizure, you have to, to put or to give uh, B6 or folinic acid. And you know, by uh, the they the, the, the seizures are usually very early in the presentation. Uh, they start from the first hour. Even they are, they may start from the intrauterine life. There, there is some seizure in the intrauterine uh, life of this uh, neonate, and it will start. So when we expect this type, we have to uh, give vitamin C or folinic acid in high doses sometimes because you know by, by B6 or pyridoxine is needed for the synthesis of GABA uh, in, the, in, in the neonate, which is very important again for uh, uh, the neon, for the neonate, since GABA, you know, as as you know, is uh, uh, not inhibitory; it is excitatory in the neonatal uh, period, and is very important uh, for uh, maturation of neurons in the neonate. Okay. Another good question. She asked uh, about the classification of uh, seizure uh, in the unit. She mentioned, what about if she did only one EG and it was non-conclusive? Should we do another EG to classify this as only clinical? Oh, yeah. no uh, this is a very important question because it, try, uh, it takes attention to the, uh, to the uh, truth. It, it is not a one a single EG. In this classification, we are not using a single EEG. We are using a video EEG study for hours or even for days to go or to get uh, this classification. A single EEG may give us uh, no, 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 uh, any, any, any result. We have to be, uh, if we have no video EEG, we have to repeat this EEG again and again sequentially so that we can get a better uh, uh, result. One point uh, is very important, uh, really, is that in the EEG, when it is single or when it is not very sequential or when we have no video EEG, we will depend really on the background, on the assessment of the background of the EEG. It is very important. A normal background in a neonate tells you a lot about the health of this neonate. And it is even more important uh, and more useful for the clinician than the EEG, which shows you uh, some paroxysmal uh, changes here or there, say, say, pairs or like that. A question about the classification again. There is too many questions about classification. A really interesting topic. Uh, he asked about uh, why it's only focal again. Why uh, we don't include generalized uh, seizure in classification? Yeah. It is not my opinion. It is the opinion of the task force, which I just, uh, uh, you know, what to what of you the details of this study of the task force? Uh, I believe that we have so we should have uh, to put generalized seizure because you know we have myoclonic seizure, we have aridoxin deficiency, etc. Uh, in the front in one in one uh, uh, part as and we put the focal seizures in the other part when it, it, uh, it continue will contain the focal seizure which are. Uh, said now, uh, motor and non-motor and electrographic seizures. I, I believe that generalized seizures are uh, very important to be included. But I just uh, show you the task force uh, job. Okay, great. Another question, what are uh, the definition of electrographic status epilepticus in units? Oh. Uh, status epilepticus, electro, uh, neonatal uh, status is when you have abnormal in more than 50% of your recording. If you do a record for one an hour, you find more than 50%, 50% or more uh, with abnormal EEG, this is uh, suggestive for uh, neonatal status ellipticals. And again, this is one of the criticism in this the task force job because they did not uh, uh, really uh, point to the uh, this point of, of status ellipticus in any unit. Okay, uh, last question, but not least. Uh, 
what about the prognostic value of the this classification and therapeutic consideration? Uh, it is really it is the the point the important point for this classification is the prognosis, because you know when it is microepilepsy, then it is will be microclinic will be for important error of metabolism, and you know what is usually there is poor prognosis. And when there is tonic uh, epilepsy or uh, sequential may lead you to uh, some structural uh, changes, which again may give you some sort of uh, 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 prognosis. So uh, th this, it will give you some idea about the etiology. The, then the prognosis will be according to that etiology. Uh, sometimes everything is normal. You go to the benign conditions when you know benign neonatal familial epilepsy, uh, or you go to fifth day syndrome, uh, which is now regarded as Caesars and not type of epilepsy, or even you may go to sleep by clones of, of normal my sleep by clones of a neonate. So it, it depends on the etiology, which is suggested then by this classification. I think uh, there is a comment by Dr. Fatma Abdullah. Uh, she just tried. Uh, she mentioned that it's mm -hmm. uh, necessary to have corpus callosum myelination, which is not completed during infancy, in order to have generalized seizure. Maybe that's uh, why it's not included. Uh, definitely, you are very right. The, the, the problem in the neonate is that. Uh, inter interconnection between the two hemispheres is not very mature, this first. Secondly, the uh, arborizations to the uh, uh, brain stem and the points is more mature than to the cortex. I mean, caudally is more mature than it cephalically. So that uh, we have some sort of changes of, of unusual presentations of seizures in the neonate. And this uh, point of carboscalism agenesis uh, may be very important, uh, definitely. That's why in pre-term pre infants, we never had even uh, the general, uh, generalized seizures. No generalized seizures are seen in a pre-term infant. In term infants, we will find these seizures, uh, the, the, say, by clinic or, or uh, by reduction deficiency, etc. Thank you, Dr. Ghaib. It's uh, really very interesting uh, to be with us today. Uh, we don't want to leave you. We don't want to let you. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you for you and thank you for Dennis and for all of you for this nice uh, chance to present this uh, subject. Thank you very much.